Okay, Assalamu alaikum everyone. Uh, I am Fatma Ash from East Pakistan, uh, the president of the uh, of the Civil Student Society. Um, so uh, I want to welcome you all here as our first event of the year as newly forming student society. And as we all know, uh, liberalism you know affects our daily life a lot from every point, every aspect, uh, more than just the youth and the family. It impacts, it impacts your, our life in, like, from society to family, to politics, to work ethics, and it touches almost everything. And therefore, we have our honor, honorable guest, Hamid Hijab, today, to talk about liberalism here. And to to talk about Muhammad Hijab a little bit in full, uh, he's a British debater and public speaker of Egyptian descent who engaged in discussions and polemics on a wide variety of topics, including religion, politics, and society. He completed a BA in politics and MA in history from Queen Mary University. He has taught and instructed courses on humanities and languages in many contexts. He has numerous ijazat in some Islamic sciences and has studied in multiple Islamic seminaries, including the, Shin including the Shinkiti Institute, which employs a traditional Mauritanian style of teaching the sacred sciences. Muhammad is um, currently doing further postgraduate research in Islamic studies at Salas University of London. So uh, I would like to invite brother up to the stage to have his speech. No. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam ala rasulullah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wa um, This topic of liberalism is a very, very important one. Not least because liberalism is the leading ethic of the Western world. And obviously the Western world, which is the Europeans and their extensions, which is America now, are the hegemonic powers of the world. So to talk about liberalism is to talk about a very important topic, which I believe in our circles as Muslims is um, not spoken about as much as it should be. There was a time where maybe in Islamic circles we thought that the global competitor to um, Islamic ethics was other religions. So we'd think, for example, of Christianity, we'd think, for example, of potentially Hinduism, and so on. But research suggests to us that liberalism is more powerful in terms of demographic effect than all of those religions, and could be said to be in many ways more penetrating than even the Islamic ethic, ironically even in Muslim countries. So it's a very important topic to discuss. And I want to divide what I'm going to talk about today into three different subsections. I don't want to spend too much time here talking. I want to spend a little bit more time interacting so that we can have a question and answer session. We have an all-star cast from uh, London, inshallah. So it's not just going to be me taking the um, questions. It's going to be me, Brother Zakir. Hussein, Brother Hashem, and Brother Mansour, who you guys might be familiar with, um, all of which have their kind of subject-specific specialism and have engaged in numerous debates uh, in and of themselves. So that's something, inshallah, we can look forward to. So I'm going to divide this discussion into three different parts, just for brevity and conciseness. The first thing I'm going to talk about is the discussions surrounding liberalism in academia the discussions surrounding liberalism in academia. And in this we're talking about, we're going to be talking about some of the common critiques of liberalism by, you know, um, academics in the Western world, for example. The second thing we're going to talk about are the problems with liberalism, even as identified by liberals themselves. Some of the uh, issues when you put liberalism in practical impl implementation, what are some of the issues with liberalism? And number three, we're going to be talking about 
the, well, there's a big word here, I'm going to try and simplify it when we get to it, but the epistemological problem of, uh, of liberalism. Meaning, how do we get to know if li liberalism is true? Can we prove it's true? And so on. And I've done an essay on this, you can check on salam.org.uk on the publication section. This was um, what I focused on in the essay, the epistemological problem of liberalism. So these are the three things, and obviously we'll link this to Islamic society uh, and so on. So just to get started with this, in terms of liberalism, in terms of the academic discussions that are had by academics, you could say there have been many different kinds of critiques levied against liberals by different Western um, scholars. For example, very famous is the Marxist critique of economic liberalism. The Marxist critique of economic liberalism. And liberalism itself should not be seen as one monolithic thing. It's divided into social, you know, some people, to, to, to make things simple, divided into social, economic, and political, yeah? So we have Marxist critiques, utilitarian critiques. I mean, even Jeremy Bentham himself attacked uh, what would be then referred to as liberalism. But what's become quite popular nowadays is something called the a communitarian critique of uh, liberalism. Communitarian. Now, who are the communitarians? The communitarians are basically a group of scholars like Charles Taylor and Michael Sandel who say that liberalism is problematic because it re references the individual in abstractation. In other words, human beings are not individualistic by psychological and social necessity. They are more communal creatures, hence the name communitarian. So they say that why do we give, they ask the question, why do we give primacy, why do we prioritize the individual over and above, for instance, familial or communal units? Why is it that the individual, they ask, yes, is prioritized through human rights? Because if you look at, for example, the UN human rights of the, the 30 articles of the UN human rights, you'll find that most of them, if not all of them, are centered around individual human rights. You don't really find as much emphasis, if any emphasis at all, on communal or fam familial rights. You don't find that. So the, the communitarians would argue, this is a problem. This is problematic. Because why is it that you've been given, why is it that you have this false presupposition that we are autonomous and independent? When in fact, the truth is, we're not autonomous, and we're, to we're totally interdependent. We are dependent, therefore. Um, and so this is the, the argument. And I say that as a result of that, this causes moral decadence and decay. Because when you prioritize the individual over and above the family units and the communal units, then what you have is you have the individuals atomized. This is the word they use, atomized in society. Almost as if to say that there is no common linkage between those individuals. Now, they've, the individual, individualists, the liberals, they come back and they say, but this is not necessarily the case. You can still give preference to the individual whilst at the same time, you know, considering communal linkages, etc. But the case stands for the com communitarians. They say, look, look at society. They look at sociological statistics. Say, so look at the uh, for instance, the amount of people, the amount of rape that's going on, the amount of murder that's going on, the amount of X, Y, Z, all of those things, the destruction of the family unit, and so on. You know, and they'll look at these indicators as indicative of the individualistic effect, if you like. This is the problem of liberalism, they would say. And there's there's an additional interesting um, criticism, which is that, and I think this was made by Michael Sandel, where he said that, look, Liberalism claims to be neutral. It claims to be neutral. So in other words, by nature, it doesn't try to favor any of any particular religious or moral ethic. It doesn't do that. But by giving individuals rights and defining what those rights are, you've introduced an ethic here which is biased by definition. So you can't maintain a neutral thesis and at the same time say, well, Individuals should be given preference because this would be a contradiction and this is a very good argument It's a very strong argument because how could it be the case that liberalism is on one hand neutral 
objective, meaning it's looking at all things equally, to use libertarian jargon, but at the same time, it's giving more preference to individual rights over and above familial and communal rights. This is not a neutral objective stance. And so someone like Michael Sandel will say, there should be a process of arbitration whereby all of the ideas, even if they are moral ideas, or if they are religious ideas, are put on the table and there is a democratization of ideas in this sense, and then a process of arbitration where we choose which ones we think are the right ones or the correct ones and so on, because the neutral thesis cannot be maintained. So if the mutual thesis cannot be maintained, you might as well put everything on the table and let people decide. And this is a very strong argument, but of course, this is where you find tensions between secularism, liberalism and democracy. Because we always think that liberal democracies, are, liberalism and democracy work hand in hand like a hand in a glove. But there are tensions between liberalism and democracy and secularism, and this is one of them. You can have illiberal democracies, it's possible. And you can have democratic tyrannies, that's also possible. So it's not necessarily the case that just because you have liberalism that you should have democracy and secularism as always following suit like a shadow of the intellectual ideology. No, it doesn't work like that. And so therefore, we see here some tensions because secularism, is the, you're divorcing the state and religion and the church. But according to these kinds of communitarian theses, you shouldn't divorce them. Because by divorcing them, you're not giving that human being in society an ability to express their identity in the most democratic or liberal way possible. You can't tell someone, look, be yourself, do whatever you want to do. And then they tell you, look, I'm a Muslim, I'm a Christian, I'm a Jew, and so on. And you say, but hold on, all of that stuff, we don't want to hear about it. But that's, that is what defines the individual. So a communitarian would say, this is a contradiction. You can't tell me to express myself, but then when I come to do so through religious um, terminologies, for example, or phraseologies, you tell me to be quiet. And this is why secularism is problematic from a liberal perspective. And that's never thought about. We always thought, well, why is secular, uh, secularism problematic? Then we go into religious jargon. Oh, because it goes against God's law and whatnot. We don't even need to go there. We can, we can show you how secularism is problematic from a liberal perspective. When was the last time you heard that ever being said by someone, right? Or liberalism is problematic from a democratic perspective. And so on. These tensions exist. So with this, I'm going to move on swiftly to the next part of this discussion, which I think is an easy way to segue now, because we talked about what are the problems in implementation with liberalism. And I've already kind of touched upon this, is that you have these superfluous notions, these abstracted notions that only make sense in the theoretical world. And one, once you put them in the real world, they don't really mean much. I'll give you a couple of examples. One of them is freedom. Obviously, a liberal believes in freedom, yes? So what is uh, liberalism? Say, look, it's freedom to do whatever I want to do. If you go in the dictionary, the Oxford Dictionary, say, go, define freedom. The ability to do whatever you want to do. The ability to do whatever you want to do. That's impossible for any human being. It's a utopian concept that has no bearing on the real world. How can you do whatever you want to do? You're always going to be curtailed by some kind of environmental or otherwise extraneous variable. Yes? If you go to the... Uh, whatever example you want to give, I mean, everything you're... Co you can't do whatever you want to do. Simple as that. Right? You cannot do whatever you want to do. That's a false notion. So some define it, like Nozick and others, like some liberal thinkers, as freedom from coercion. So no one is stopping you to do certain things. Yes? And obviously this links to ideas of tyranny and obviously all those things. Let me give you a thought experiment to show you the, the problematic nature of this kind of conception. Let me give you two case studies. You have case study one. Somebody is there and you say, listen, you're going to do what I want or I'm going to shoot you. I'm going to kill you. Yes? 
what would you refer to that person as? A slave, yes? Because if they do what they want, this is, this is exactly how you make a slave a slave, right? If he doesn't do what you want, he, there are consequences. Death, for example. Okay. So is that person coerced? Yes, because you're, you're telling them, do this or else this. You're blackmailing them, yes? What if I say, you live in a very impoverished country and you have someone who's totally disenfranchised and the only option they have is to work. That's the only option they have, otherwise they're gonna die. You know, the, the only option they have is to work, otherwise they're gonna, a transnational company comes in and says, do what, do this, make this jumper. You're gonna work 12 hours, 18 hours. If not, we're gonna fire you. Yeah, you're finished. So what's really the difference? There's a lack of options on both of those, in both of those examples. You could argue, well, the second person has some degree of autonomy here. But what, what is that degree of autonomy? In, in both cases, if the person doesn't do what you want them to do, they're going to die. So the economic conditions led one person, yes, to be forced or coerced, in, in effect, into a certain reality. Wherein in the first example, obviously the, the, the violent ramifications led them to do what they want to do. So what is freedom then? We really have to reassess. If you ask a liberal, what is freedom? They won't give you a comprehensive answer. What is the freedom you're fighting for? What is the freedom you're dying for? They won't give you a comprehensive answer. They can't give you a comprehensive answer because as soon as you put this idea of freedom into the real world, all of, all of those questions come into play. We're not free. Simple as that. Like Rousseau said, man is born free but everywhere in chains. There is no uh, exact freedom here. There is only some freedoms, and that's all there will ever be, right? Another problematic notion is equality. You say, oh, we are born free. We are born equal. What do you mean we are born equal? Seriously, this is, it's problematic on every level. We're definitely not born equal. 100% not born equal by every psychological and scientific standard. That's the one thing we can guarantee that we're not born equal. Anything else you can guarantee but we're not born equal unless you have twins. That's maybe one case study where, okay, there's some, something to be said about that. But in most cases, we're born completely unequal. Psychologically, physiologically, biologically, emotionally. Totally unequal. We live in different parts of the world come from different families with different economic provisions. Some are born with diseases. Some others are not born with diseases. Some are born like this and some are born... Even John Locke admitted this himself in his two treatises of government that he wrote. One of the first books to kind of talk about the liberal position. So what do we actually mean we're born equal? It's just... What do we mean by that? How are we born equal? So... They've realized the problem with this. It's a problematic notion. What do we mean by equality? So they've had to refine it and say, look, there's a difference between equality of opportunity and equality of outcome. Yes? And what we're trying to do is secure an equality of opportunity, not an equality of outcome. Or some would say, yes, we want equality of opportunity and equality of outcome. But that's a discussion amongst themselves. But equality of opportunity is in and of itself impossible. What do you mean by equality of opportunity? What do you really mean by that? Do we all have the same? Should we all have the same opportunities? Because when you start bringing in the exception, then you're going to see too many exceptions. A disabled person, they don't have the same opportunities as the rest of us. Should they have? I mean, when I came into this uh, university, I'm sure you have like ramps and... <laughs> And, and, and lifts and whatever for disabled people that are not the same for uh, people that have functioning, fully functional uh, abilities. That's not equality of opportunity. Uh, should we have blind people driving buses? That's not, uh, that's not equality of opportunity. So well, we should have equality of opportunity. Therefore, blind people should drive buses. No. We have com <laughs> there are so many examples of where it makes sense for there not to be an equality of opportunity. So then we start questioning the whole precept. Yes, we start questioning the whole precept. To what extent should we have equality of opportunity? And 
Usually a generally accepted rule or maxim is where we don't define the exception by the rule. So you're not going to accept the rule by the exception. But when you have so many exceptions like this in society, then the rule becomes undefined now. It's problematic. And that's why they talk about this amongst themselves. How can we maintain an egalitarian, equal opportunity premise when we're doing all of these things? Yes? Not everyone can vote. Children can't vote. And so on. There's so many examples why they have reasons for it. But that's the, that's, the, that's the whole point. If you have reasons for it, it's not equality of opportunity. So these are some implementable things which are frankly contradictory when put into implementation. And shows you the feeble nature of liberalism. Especially when put in contra contradistinction with other ideologies like um, democracy and uh, secularism. It's a feeble nature. It's, what are you actually trying to say? All of your... Um, all of your precepts, when put into implementation, they change completely. But usually when I have a discussion about liberalism, I don't mention all of those points. I mention my main argument with liberalism is not the com communitarian argument, the ontological argument, the sociological It's not any of those things I've just mentioned. These are good arguments. Yes, you can use them. But the argument I use is what you call the epistemological argument. And this is a very important argument. I'm going to try and explain it to you, okay? What I'm saying is, why should we believe in liberalism? Now, someone will say, because it gives people all of those things we just said, freedom of opportunity, freedom of expression, and all those things. Someone, other people will say, what are the alternatives? Look at all, all of the other alternatives. You know, liberalism stops bloodshed. It stops people from killing each other. It allows cohesion and harmony and all that. No problem, I agree. And we, we are for all of those things. And by the way, there is an intersectionality. Like an, a, a, if you had a Venn diagram, or for example, from an Islamic perspective, all the things we believe in and all the things that are, are in liberal theory, there is a, you know, a flesh that joins, if you like, the two kinds of ethics. It's not like everything we uh, believe in is completely uh, in opposition to liberalism. There's a lot of things we agree with them. Anti-corruption, transparency in government, transparency generally speaking, you know, uh, tolerance for other people of other religions and so on. I mean, we, we agree with all of those things. In the Quran, la ikraha fi din, you know, there is no compulsion in religion. We are not against those principles, you know. But what we are saying is that why should we take this ideology on wholesale as if it is the truth? Because that's the way it's being marketed to us. Now someone will say, look, I mean, this is a, the sentiment that's kind of widespread in um, Western circles, and even now Eastern circles as well, that they try and keep away from religion. Say, so look, I don't want anything to do with religion. We've had the religious experiment in the West, and it went terribly bad. Look what the church did. It inhibited all the rationality and freedom of expression and thought, and we don't need this again. Yes, and their liberalism gives us a mechanism out of this. Yes. It gives us a mechanism out of all of this. So we need liberalism to ensure rationality, etc. And to ensure expression and ideas are continually debated in public and whatnot. That's a fair enough argument. But here's the problem. Liberalism itself can be seen as a religion. What is religion? Now obviously if you look in the dictionary definition of what religion is, they will connect it with things like God and or some sacred thing that is worshipped or and so on. But the truth is, if you look terminologically at the word religion and some of the definitions of the word religion in, for example, anthropology, history, sociology and, and so on, you'll find that religion has more inclusive definitions. Any system of life, a social structure, an idea that explains the meaning of life. For example, Bayan and I'll try and put his, maybe his, um, his reference in the description box to this video. He has like a comprehensive uh, definition like this in a book called The World Religions or something of that nature. So if you have such an inclusive definition which includes fundamentally the ideologies, then really liberalism is a religion. Because it's a, an organization of ideas which allows people to live a life in a certain way and to think of themselves ontologically in a certain context, in a certain way. So really and truly, 
from an Islamic perspective especially, I mean the word deen, the way of life. The word deen means way of life, right? So liberalism is a deen of some sorts in the Arabic language, certainly from our conception it is. And that's what we have to think of it as. Liberalism is a deen with, with khawaid and usul and furu'ah and all of these things. It has fundamentals, it has everything. Liberalism is a deen. And we're looking at some of the usul now and thinking, okay, the usul, the foundational premises of liberalism, and thinking there's some problems with the usul. And I'll give you a few examples. If you look at the initial works of people like John Locke, who, who is probably the most prominent liberal who ever lived, and one of the most influential men who ever lived, yeah? He wrote a book called The Tru Two Treatises of Government. And you'll find that in, in his explanation of how, what are we basing liberalism on? He based it on, you could say, two or three different principles. Two of them I'm going to outline to you now. One of them, the idea of being born equal and free, is taken from theology. It says God-given rights. There's no doubt about it. John Locke believed in God. He believed in, by the way, he was not a Trinitarian, which is quite interesting. Yeah? He rejected the Trinity. He's quite a clever man. Yes. He rejected the Trinity, but he still believed in God. So John Locke, he based his philosophy on two premises. One of them is called the hedonistic principle. Some say hedonistic. Tomato, tomato. No problem. Yeah. What is hedonism? What is hedonism? Hedonism is the idea, it's really like pain and pleasure. Yes, it's pain and pleasure. So you're trying to maximize pain, you're trying to maximize pleasure. Yes, not maximize pain. <laughs> and you're trying to minimize pain. That's the, that is really it. Yeah. And the other thing is that we're endowed these equal and free rights from God. This tradition of hedonism or hedonism was continued up until... For example, John Stuart Mill, another very important figurehead in liberalism. So what do liberals base their philosophy on? The idea that you yourself, as an individual, have the best understanding of yourself and what makes you happy. And therefore, you have to minimize as much of life's pains as possible and maximize as much of life's pleasures as possible, so long as you don't harm anyone else. And this is the harm principle that John, Prince, uh, John Stuart Mill put into play. So long as you don't harm anyone else. This is liberalism. So long as you don't harm anyone else through fraud or forgery, because that's an invalid type of action in liberalism. That's, that's basically it. But if we take a step back and say, but hold on. Okay, no problem. I understand where you're coming from. But the issue is this. The issue is, how can you prove the hedonistic principle as a true, morally objective moral? I'm not talking about something you feel as a subjective experience, where you say, I like this and I don't like this. Everyone can have their own subjective beliefs. But from a morally realist perspective, there's no way of proving this is the truth. So there is a degree of axiomacity, which means an axiom is something you, you believe in without evidence. That's what an axiom is. So there is a degree of axiomacity involved in believing the hedonistic principle. You believe it without evidence, basically. So you believe in a, a, a whole philosophy, a whole political philosophy, a whole ideology, which you've based your whole Western empire on, but really, when we get down to the first principles, we realize there is nothing proving that at all. It is a subjective value judgment of a man, an English man named John Locke, and then his disciples and followers, and those who expounded upon his philosophy, who lived in the 17th and 18th century. He died in the 18th century. This is, a, this is where you're taking your ideology from. So... Hedonism has to be looked at very closely here. Epistemologically, are we saying that hedonism, yes, is true, is a truth? Just in the same way as 2 plus 2 equals 4 is true. Yes, that's a mathematical truth. You can argue otherwise. Some people have, by the way. 
We're not going, going to go into that much deep philosophy today. But just in the same way as 2 plus 2 equals, obviously the Christians, you know, 1 plus 1 plus 1. I'm not going to make any jokes here, but, but you know, I mean, <laughs> but 2 plus 2 equals 4 is a mathematical truth, yes? So can we say that hedonism, the idea that there's pain and pleasure and they constitute for us basically the ultimate God. That's what Bentham called them. And I was, subhanAllah, I was actually amazed when I read this. He says, you have two lords, Bentham, a uh, utilitarian. He, he, Bentham was a great contributor to the liberal tradition, even though he didn't agree with it. He said, there's two lords, pain and pleasure. And you know when he said this, I remembered the ayah in the Quran. He says, أَفَرَأَيْتَ مَنِ اتَّخَذَ إِلَهَهُ هَوَىٰ Have you seen the one who has taken his desires as his God? SubhanAllah, everything is in, يعني, is in the Quran. مَا فَرَطْنَا فِي الْكِتَابِ مِنْ شَيْءٍ Allah has put everything in there. The same person who existed a long time ago, now he's justified his, 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 his animalism, right? His hedonism. So, I don't know if animalism is the right word, by the way. Yes, but th that's, that's the point here, yeah? So you can't prove that liberalism is true. They'll say, we know that. A lot of them will agree to that. I was, re I was reading, for example, John uh, Chavez, I think his name is. He, he's got a book talking about the UN. It's called something like Liber uh, Human Rights and the Liberal Project. And basically, he's saying we should use the UN to liberalize, basically, the, uh, the illiberals. The illiberals, and he uses three or four examples of illiberals. And one of the main ones he uses in his book is Muslim, are Muslims, Orthodox, traditional Muslims. We need to liberalize them. We need to make them think like us, liberalize them. And this is what I'm going to move on to, the effect on Muslims. You see, just like back in the days where people used to worship statues. Yes, they used to worship, and even now, I mean, they used to worship, and they still worship statues. You know, statues, what's going on here, man? We've gone past this. You don't worship a statue? Why do we worship a sanam, a statue? Yes? Why are you doing that? He can't help you. He can't, you know, do anything for you. And you ask them, says, because my forefathers did it. Yeah? My forefathers. Nowadays, if you ask that person, if you ask them, you know, why are you worshipping a statue? Have you got any evidence for this? They say, no, I don't really have any evidence. But my forefathers were doing it, etc. And, and they're just so, you know, deeply involved in the culture of the day. That is difficult to break away from it, to the statue. But we look at those historical moments and we think, that's very weird. But the truth is, history is present because that's exactly what liberals do. Uh, the, the, the same as, axiomatity applies. You cannot prove that that, that uh, particular statue can help you. In the same way, you can't prove that liberalism is true. In the same exact way, from an epistemological perspective, there's no difference. You worshipping that statue is the same as uh, basically believing in liberalism. What's the difference? If you look at first principles, you can't prove. They're both unprovable. They're unprovable. So from that perspective, it's a religion. It must be seen as a religion. And those individuals now, and maybe, in our, maybe you know some of them, maybe I know some of them, secular liberal-minded liberal, liberal -minded kind of individuals, say, look, I'm not into religion. Say, listen, you are into religion, man. Say, I've had enough of smoking cigarette, you know, and they're with their friends outside of a club, and you, you tell them, Taqillah, you know, have fear of Allah. Come on, it's haram what you do. And they're smoking. I'm not into religion, you know what I'm trying to say. Say, wait a minute, hold on, man, you are a religious guy. You're a liberal, you believe in liberal principles. You say, why are you not into religion? Because, you know, it's done this and it's done that, and I just believe in this. I believe we should all be free, and I believe in this, and I believe it, there should be no constraints, and this... Well, you're just giving me your religious principles and you're telling me you're not into religion. These are religious principles. Let's change the language. They don't like that language because it makes them look like going back into the Dark Ages. But they have to know that they're already in the Dark Ages. And there's no necessary link, by the way, between technology and liberalism. There's absolutely none. Because just because the Western world found, uh, you know, there was the Industrial Revolution followed by many other events that happened in history in the 17th and 18th century, which coincided with the liberal project, it doesn't mean that liberalism was the cause for any of that. In other words, some people have this false assumption when you're looking at, and this is a post-colonial reality, when you're looking at Americans or 
English people or French people say, look, they have clean streets, they have technology in their countries and so on. This must be because of what they believe in. What's, what's that got to do with what they believe in? Go to Japan. They've got even cleaner streets and they've got even bigger uh, cities. They're not the same as those individuals. Technology is something completely independent, completely independent from ideology. That's the whole point of technology. It's something which is independent. So you can't link those two things. Look, you know, ever since we've become liberal, all of these good things have happened to us. It's good. There is no necessary link. Correlation does not entail causation. It's one of the fallacies they use. So don't connect those two things together. And as we're in Turkey, obviously, the best people that should know this are the Turks themselves. Yes, what do you mean by that, man? Are you trying to be political? Are you trying to get us arrested? No, no, I'm not going to go anywhere. Don't worry. <laughs> I'm not going to say anything controversial. But what I am going to say is that think of the history of the Turkish, right? I mean, if we wanted to make this false argument, and it is a false argument, I would say, well, actually, Turkey and its history indicates to us the closer they have been to Quran and Sunnah, the more technology they've had and the more militarily successful they've been. Look at 1453. There was no liberalism there. Tell me, 1453, what happened? When Muhammad Fatah, yeah, go ahead, I, I'll give it away. Yes, in, this is Constantinople, yes? Istanbul is Constantinople. 1453, this was before John Locke was even uh, born. There was no liberalism at this time. Yeah, you can't say, well, you know, the Turks, we, we were very successful because of liberalism. 1453 was one of the biggest military successes of all time, in all of history. And there was no liberalism involved in that. So we're not going to make a false argument here and say that just because you, you are Muslim, you, oh, tilkal ayam, nudawilu habayna nas. Allah says in the Quran, some days, these are the days which we alternate between the people. Some days the, 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 the non-Muslims will be successful and other days the Muslims will be successful. It's nothing to do. It has something to do with ideology to some, to some our spiritual perspective. But from their secular perspective, it has nothing to do with it. So they can't use that argument, right? But now there are two things. If you really think about it deeply, if you wanted to co compile an exhaustive list of how they're trying to liberalize us, it boils down to two things, media and education. And we're here in a university, yeah? I thought about this quite deeply, yeah? And I thought, really, it boils down to two things, media and education. And the final message I want to leave to the, because I don't want to, I want to make this into an interactive session, inshallah, because we want to bring the everyone up so we can have a question and answer but the final message I want to put to the people here today is that look they couldn't colonize the Turks they, and they by the way if you look at the old history and the records they were very angry about this they were jealous <laughs> there were times in history if you read the colonial histories of the English they were very they were very jealous basically of the Turkish uh, people because of what they were able to do, especially in the like 15th century, 16th, when it was a strong empire. They yeah, were very jealous. And they were still, you know, at this time, because the English, they only started to become quite powerful, maybe in the 17th century, yes? The age of discovery and so on, when they found, they found land, yeah? Yes, it was a considerable chunk of land, United States and, you know, Canada and all those things. But they found land, yeah? The point I'm making to you is, they couldn't colonize the Turks uh, militarily. But we're in, a, we're in a point in history now where they're trying to colonize the Turks ideologically. And I believe, I'm sorry to say, looking at the data from Pew Research and other things, I feel like now Turkey is at a crossroads. And so is the rest of the Muslim world. Where colonization might not be happening militarily, but it might very well be happening ideologically. And they're using media and they're using education to force, their false, to force their false gods on you. And they're not even telling you, they're not even giving you a reason why to believe in that, th that, that thesis. Why to believe that we are, the, you know, we are in charge of ourselves and we know the best and, and we are our own gods, basically. They want you to be your own god. But we are saying to you, that, you know, we believe in la ilaha illallah. We believe in that there's no god worthy of worship except for Allah. Yes, and whenever we believed in that, like Ibn Khaldun said in his Muqaddimah, it's an interesting thing. He says that when a, when a civilization has that belief 
and they don't fear death. Because a, necessarily, a necessary result of believing in Islam is that you care less about this life. Yeah? And by extension, you care less about death. And what that does to a community and society is, to be honest with you, it makes it more brave. And the more brave a society is, the more dangerous it is to other societies, in the sense that it cannot be manipulated or messed around on an international level. Yeah? So they're afraid of that. If you go back to La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, you will have an advantage from that perspective. Otherwise, let the colonization begin. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And now I'll call uh, upon all the brothers, inshallah, to come up. Yes. Uh, so this, this section, inshallah, is going to be a question and answer session. We're going to open it up. Any questions that you've ha you have or anything like that, we're here to, to be of assistance, inshallah. And there's four of us, so if one of us can't answer, the other one should be able to do so, inshallah. Yeah. Yeah, so you can ask any question you want that you might feel like, you know, um, within reason, obviously, we're not going to give you a fatwa here. <laughs> but within reason, ask whatever questions you want around this topic or any topic that you feel comfortable, you know, asking questions about. Yes. Oh, sorry. Uh, my question is about why liberalism is uh, problematic from uh, from a democracy point of view. So uh, the question was, how is liberalism problem? How can liberalism be problematic from a democratic point of view? Don't forget, there are different types of democracy and different kinds of liberalism. I think we should be clear about that to begin with. So the initial democracy that was put forward by the ancient Greeks which comes from the two Greek words demos and kratia, basically literally means people power. People power. And it took a direct form. So in other words, people would come up and they would ask, they would try and answer public questions, etc. Then it evolved into representative democracy because it was very difficult for there to, that to be maintained. For basically a whole populace of, let's say, a million people yeah, to answer you know, every little question that they have in, in terms of politics, etc. will be unimplementable. Yeah? Liberal, social liberalism, social liberalism, economic liberalism and political liberalism are problematic in so much as the following. Number one, in democracy, the assumption is that you have one vote per person. Yes? In, in, in liberalism, the equality premise also stands. So there's something in, in connection with those two things. In implementation, most, if not, I'm not going to say all, but the majority, the vast majority of countries that have democratic systems, they have a system of uh, what you call electoral representation. So I'll give you an example of Great Britain. They have something called first past the post. First past the post. I don't want to go into too much detail, but the idea is if you vote for a bigger party, a bigger uh, political party, you have more of a voice. If you vote for, for example, the Green, we have a party called the Green Party, yeah? You have less voice. So the bigger the party that you vote for, the more you have of a voice. But that contradicts the equality premise of liberalism because how, how and why should you be given a higher voice just because you support a bigger party, yeah? That's why smaller parties, they, they want proportional representation. But the, the problem still stands. How can you maintain equality? and at the same time have a democratic system which is completely unequal from that perspective. This is one of many examples in implementation. Uh, other things include, for example, in relation to uh, economic liberalism. Once again, the democratic premise is that we should have equality among citizens. Yeah? Even though, ironically, in the beginning, they didn't allow women to vote. Yeah? They didn't allow women to. They called them the idiom, I think. It's like the, the women, the children, and the slaves, they couldn't vote in back in the days, in, until 1917 or whatever it was, in, in Great Britain, and then thereafter in other countries. I think Canada was actually first. Anyways, the point is that, uh, yes, so with democracy from that perspective, we said that the equality premise couldn't stand with liberalism, because liberalism is, in the plur pluralism of uh, many ideas, panoply of ideas, you're going to have 
some ideas which have more power than others. For example, in electoral campaigns, in electoral campaigns, those who have more money, economic money, are going to be able to do more uh, media campaigns and so on. And so they're going to be able to have a bigger campaign and their democratic, the democratic rights of those with smaller parties are once again going to be curtailed. So equality is a problem for both democracy and liberalism. And you can't maintain equality and either democracy or liberalism. This is a problem. So both of those things can contradict at times. Yeah, that makes sense? I can give you some more answers, but inshallah, that will be another longer question. Do you want to add to it, inshallah? Any other questions? Uh, I think there's one over there. Uh, okay, that one first and then. Thank you for the very enlightening um, talk. Um, my, my question, or maybe comment as well, um, many agree that the Muslim Ummah is suffering uh, from the, um, the crisis, intellectual crisis, and also uh, spiritual crisis, um, uh, ranging from um, uh, caused by uh, extremism, radicalism, and liberalism, uh, branch out from uh, neo uh, modernism. Uh, this group, I mean, uh, uh, namely li liberal Muslim, uh, has liberalized or have liberalized Sharia, liberalized Aqidah, and also uh, the Quran. Uh, and uh, the other problem as well is that there is another group, um, uh, conservatism which undermine the rule of reason. Uh, so these are the, 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 the phenomena today, which is in, in either case, they yeah, I mean, give problem to the Ummah. What is your comment on that? Thank you. Got a question? Yeah. You can add to it if you want. No, sir. No, sir. No, sir. No, sir. No. Sorry, was that a question or a comment? Um, <laughs> your comment. Okay. Yeah. okay, so what exactly was the question? I mean, the I know. The question is that um, the role like liberal Islam in the case of Indonesia, for example, that liberalize um, um, uh, Sharia, which is very serious, oh, uh, liberalize Aqidah, uh, which uh, they, uh, they introduce uh, religious pluralism, and uh, so on and so forth, which is very uh, serious and challenging to the Aqidah of Muslims. Okay, so Thank you. I believe you mean like they're trying to self-interpret the Quran and the Sharia uh, as, yes, as yeah. they as yes, you see yes. fit in the society. Yes, they are too liberal yes. in uh, interpreting uh, the Sharia yeah. and the Quran and, and other fundamental uh, belief of Islam. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, can I, you want to come? You want to, yeah, go on, please. What I think it is, is it's a case of when a nation becomes weak, they like to imitate those who are in power. Liberalism, there's no such thing as liberalism, Islam. Islam is we submit to God's will according to our sources. Mm -hmm. So liberalism is something that there are certain Muslims who want to whitewash Islam to please the colonialist masters. We're still suffering from colonialism. This is the after effects of a couple of centuries of being ruled by dominant forces and we're still affected mentally to this day. And because of that, we get other Muslims who go to the other extreme to counteract the liberals and they end up being extremists. In Surah 2, Ayah 143, we are told to be a middle nation. We shouldn't be liberals, we shouldn't be extreme, we should be in a middle path, which is follow the Quran and the Sunnah and do not give your own opinion, but judge according to what the sources say. That's the only way to be successful as an Ummah, by trying to work out what is Allah's um, will regarding any matter and not trying to force our own opinions and thoughts on our sources. Is that, is that good enough, sister? I think so, thank you. Yeah. Because obviously, I mean, the deen is something that we shouldn't interpret ourselves as we have got the ulamas. We have got a, something from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He sent, he sent messengers 
and these messengers were appointed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they imparted not only the, the message that was revealed to them from Allah but they also implemented in their life with the actions like the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and also the messengers before them and today we don't have any prophets so that uh, prophethood is no more after the last messenger Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and now we have their ulamas and they are the ones who are responsible in terms of um, interpreting and also educating the masses and if the, the young people and also the, uh, the others if they stop basically taking knowledge from these qualified ulamas then they, they will be basically lost because they'll start interpreting and everything is subjective then you don't have any uniform way of practicing anything in your deen even the five pillars they'll have some sort of uh, self-interpretation we have certain sects called the hadith rejectors today and these people they what they do is like they interpret the Quranic ayahs by themselves so you ask them how many rakas you pray and they tell you oh we just pray somehow anyhow we want basically Allah tells us to pray but he doesn't specify how many rakas so we just pray how many we want when we want so on I mean not exactly like I said even they amongst themselves do not agree about the rulings of these particular things so yeah the i think the uh the, it's list i mean uh, taking the knowledge from the ones who are more knowledgeable this is also something that's advised in the quran and the ulamas i think fit that particular description inshallah i mean hopefully that answers your question Assalamu alaikum. i have two questions uh, number one is uh, how did uh, liberalism, liberalism idea get so successful? Which uh, methodologies did they use for bring their dawa in, uh, first of all, in the West or among their own population and then exporting to also other, other countries? Uh, number two is, as Muslim, what can we learn from the dawa or the job? Can we use the method to our own dawa, uh, spreading Islam? Uh, it was the same, uh, same way. Okay. So you the first one, you answer the second one. I'll answer the first one, inshallah. Um, and we'll answer the second one. So, why did it very successful? Is because of the wars that, you know, made it very successful. Uh, for the most part, there, there, is, there is a degree of acceptance, social accept acceptance as well. So we can't be completely um, one-sided in our response here. Um, some of the wars include, obviously, the colonization of the Americas in particular. That was a very, very important thing. I mean, uh, after the Age of Discovery, and they found... Uh, because the Age of Discovery and all those things that happened hap coincided when, with the time when liberalism was becoming popular. And when new nations were being built now, for example, United States of America and France in particular, those two nations, when they were being built and they, and they had their own kind of um, documents, le legislative documents or constitutional documents even in the case of both of those countries, they put, they made it quite liberal. I mean, it, it, it is a liberal state in a, in a sense, right? And when we say liberal here, we're not talking about left-leaning politics. We're talking about the philosophical liberalism of John Locke, uh, Montesquieu, uh, Voltaire and so on. And so therefore, Obviously, checks and balances, separation of powers, that was all there. Social liberalism became very popular after that as well. So, um, first and foremost, the colonial expansion to, into the Americas, the establishment of those nations as, in a sense, liberal states, uh, and then thereafter, the Napoleonic Wars, which were very much uh, barbaric, to use <laughs> words that they would use uh, for, for religious wars, uh, very successful at the same time. And obviously, um, very influential in the spread of liberalism, not only in the Western world, because obviously the Napoleonic Wars were in the West, but also into the Eastern world. As you guys know, Napoleon went into Egypt and many of those countries as well. And there's many records of how Egypt was liberalized uh, through that such, a, such an invasion. Uh, and obviously, the, the colonial experience. I mean, when England or Britain, as it was known, the British Empire became the largest empire in the whole world. France was not close behind, you know, far away behind. Uh, and all those European nations colonized the world. Liberal ideas then trickled down into Africa and into Asia and into the Middle East and so on. So all of those things that happened, 
obviously. And there's a degree of social acceptance. And don't forget, it's a very attractive ideology as well. Let's be honest. I mean, the reason why liberalism is a very attractive ideology is because it appeals to your sense of impulse. Yes, I mean, let's, totally. I mean, liberalism appeals to your sense. Just do it. Enjoy your life. All those things. I mean, that's a very, very powerful uh, ideology from a, from a psychological perspective. Just telling someone, giving someone the ability or perceived freedom, but the ability to to uh, experiment in all those ways that were once seen as taboo. So because it's quite an attractive ideology from that perspective as well, it was accepted and people don't want to leave it for, let's say, for example, more restrictive. Ideology. It's difficult to go from this lifestyle to that lifestyle. So for all of those reasons, I think liberalism has become quite successful. And don't forget there were wars like the Cold War, which polarized the world in a sense, liberalism versus communism. People were forced to choose. There was a great deal of ideological um, pressures that the United States of America in particular put into the media project, films being made, Hollywood, Bollywood, whatever it is. I don't know what they have here in uh, Turkey. Do they have an alternative? It's Hollywood, something like that, yeah? <laughs> and so on, right? So that's, that's what's happened. So um, all of those factors combined make it pretty much the, the dominant paradigm in the or dominant ethic in the West. The education system. And the education system. Um, yeah, edu education system, all those things. And uh, I think that's, that's what's made it successful. Just moving on from there. You see, to remedy a problem, first it's important to understand the cause of the problem. Right? Often we don't realize what problems are associated with liberalism and because of not understanding that this is a problem because liberalism or the idea of you know one can individually choose or even collectively choose as individuals because it seems to give progress because you now have unlimited free thought your thoughts are not somehow restricted anymore you can just do you can just want you can just wish whatever of course there are some limitations imposed by the society for reasons um, society function, function of the society. But the appeal is there because you have no restrictions. Because as Brother Muhammad Hijab pointed out, the reason why it's appealing because it's going through your impulses because you feel that you want to be happy, right? You want to have enjoyment. You want your wants and desires, then it's like never end of it. So one of the things you will see Islam also highlights is the purification of yourself where you somehow realize internally that there are going to be this dichotomy between what I want and what I should not do because there is do's and don'ts. As a Muslim, when you submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what have you done is you are sincerely saying, I willingly submit. What does submission mean? You've already surrendered. What have you surrendered from? What are you, who, are you, who have you surrendered to? There's a surrendering of your will. Now that will be willingness to do something what Allah has already commanded not to do, right? You are saying, no, I am surrendering my will to what Allah and His Messenger wants. So when we look at this idea of liberalism, of course it's going to appeal to everyone, and especially people who are irreligious, irreligious, those who have no religion whatsoever, they don't have any belief in a deity or God or a creator, what they have is their own self, what their self wants. Of course, to them, success is what makes them happy. If wealth makes them happy, they will want to be wealthy. If power makes them happy, they want to be more powerful. If dominance, dominating others makes them happy, they want to be more dominant than others. That's why other people go into war, because they have their power and their land, but they still want to go and expand on others and have more power, right? So, Looking at the Islamic perspective, as Muslims, if we know that this struggle between the needs and the wants and what we shouldn't do, because we are created here for a reason, first and foremost, the reason we are existing is because Allah placed us in this world for a reason, that a purpose is set, you fulfill this purpose, and then you will have successful afterlife in Jannah where there's eternal happiness, joy, bliss, tranquility, and peace. So you have to maintain the boundaries that is set. Now, boundaries means what? Restrictions, isn't it? Whenever we have a boundary, it means a restriction. You will be restricted from 
unlimited enjoyment, unlimited greed, unlimited envy, unlimited, all of these things, you, there will be restrictions. So Muslims need to reclaim their Islamic understanding, right? You need to go back to what makes a Muslim? What is a Muslim? Why are we Muslims in the first place? Then you'll realize these ideologies that they're coming through. Yes, you can combat them. But you're saying, look, these ideologies are actually ideologies of the nafs. It is all about making your nafs do whatever your nafs wants to do, yourself, your soul wants to do. As Muslims, as we return to Quran and Sunnah, you will be within a boundary. And that boundary is your protection. Now, I was speaking to a brother there earlier on saying how the hudud, the boundaries that Islam provides in terms of what we can't do, what we're not allowed to do, whether it's to do with, you know, even violating other people's rights. Imagine you, want, you like someone's car and you say, I'm going to have it by force. I mean, you can't do that because you're violating the rights of someone else. So there has to be this restriction. Now, how does Islam maintain and preserve this boundary? by setting up certain rules and regulations. And of course, some people won't like these rules and regulations because it restricts them, restricts their freedom from getting it. Okay? So when you have a boundary, the hudud, and Islam is practiced within it, you will be safe. Safe from what? You'll be safe from the shackles that will be put through to you artificially by your own desires. Because your desires will make you its slave. You will be slave to your desires. You want to be slave to Allah. Yeah? So when you practice the hudud, implement the hudud in your lives, and you will see how the society functions. So when you have laws of crime and punishment, for example, of course the liberals and others will see it as very, very harsh. Of course they will. Because it's a very severe punishment of, say, stealing. Why cutting off the hands of a thief? It's not just a normal punishment, is it? It's a very, very harsh punishment. Cutting off a hand is a harsh punishment. Of course, the reasons are there to protect the individual and protect the society. Because if... I'll let, give you an example. Imagine the punishment for murder was 10 Turkish lira. Is it going to stop murdering? Because there are individuals out there who are very angry very emotional and they don't like you say I've got 20 lira in my pocket and if 10 lira is a punishment for murder I can get away with two murders it is not going to somehow give them this deterrent effect yeah but if it was like look if you murder someone you will be hanged or electrified or crucified whatever you'll be you know you'll be killed by the hands of justice that individual will think twice. Yeah? So there is a deterrent effect. So Islamic punishment system, when the liberals looked at it like this is very harsh, this is backdated, barbaric, how can you do that? Because that's what you'll hear. Backdated, outdated, you know, very harsh. The reasons are there. Because it has a very powerful deterrent effect. Go back to Islamic history and see how many people were punished, how many hands were chopped off when Islam was implemented in its entirety. That's what we should be looking at. So when you concentrate on this understanding of how Islam provides this boundary, it's for a reason. It is for the betterment of the society, and of course it will make you successful in the hereafter. So as Muslims then, what are our roles and responsibilities? What are our concerns? We need to go back to the understanding of Islam. We need to really say, look, I can understand there are alternatives put forward there, very appealing alternatives, okay? Very appealing. Appealing to what? Emotions. But is it appealing to reason? Look at the Islamic society, the Islamic model, the Islamic framework, contextually, as a whole, holistically. Compare with all the other models and see which models is just and fair and practical. That's what we should be doing. Because unless you compare and say, look, these ideas that you're giving about liberalism, I mean, as we have learned today, it contradicts on so many levels, even in societal aspects. But people still push forward this view because it's like an appeal alternative. What other alternatives are there? Islam, perhaps. 
the best alternative. No, we would say Islam is not the best alternative. Islam is the solution. That is how our mindset should be. That we should think that Islam is not providing an alternative. Remember, every time we have a discussion, we're thinking like, okay, let me give you an alternative. No, you're not giving an alternative. You're giving the solution. All the others are alternatives. And you see how the alternative, which one is a better alternative or not. And talking about backwardness and outdatedness, is democracy a new thing? Isn't that very, very backward, very outdated thousands of years ago? And people are fighting for democracy. So it's not about how old the system is that makes it impractical for the society now. If that was the case, then everyone would have left democracy a long time ago. So Islam, just because it's 1439 or 40 years ago, it doesn't mean it is not suitable today. It doesn't mean it cannot compete with the ideas of liberalism, the ideas of Hinnathism, hedonism, whatever, materialism, all these concepts where it is free from the reality of worshipping Allah as he should be worshipped. Because we are here for a reason. Let's not forget that. So just summarizing the responsibilities and the things that we should do as Muslims. Number one, understand that we are Muslims. That's our identity. Islam is our identity. Yes, you can be born Turkish. Yes, you can be born a Pakistani or an Arab. Okay, that you can have this ethnic identity. But you chose to be a Muslim still today. That is what your identity should be. I am a Muslim because I've surrendered to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Since I have surrendered, then comes the next point. I will, of course, have some boundaries and limitations. And I will, of course, maintain those boundaries and limitations. And I will make sure that people understand why there are boundaries, why there are restrictions, why there are not assimilations between Islam and other. But there could be integration, possible, but never assimilation. So do not assimilate into the ideas of all these isms. Maintain the boundary that you are a Muslim. And yes, I can be Muslim and I can be progressive. I can be Muslim and I can still have reason. Going back to the sister when you asked this question. That the, the conflict between conservatism and total you know, ideas of liberalism. No, Islam, as the brother said, is in the middle. We are ummatan wasata. We are in the middle where we do use reason, but reason has limitations. We do use our intellect, we do use our ideas, what we call ijtihad, where we developed newer systems, newer models, newer framework based on the existing one that is provided from the Quran and Sunnah. So we are not going to say like, we have to choose either this end of total, you know, literal conservatism, where there's no reason, we just flow, follow blindly, or totally abandon everything and just go by reason only. No, come back in the middle. And that's where the solution is. Uh, <clears throat> Assalamu alaikum. No, uh, my question is how do we convince fellow Muslims of the legitimacy of the Sharia over other ideologies, ethical, and legal models? Good job. 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 So, the, legitim the legitimacy of the Sharia is established through the legitimacy of its primary text. Um, and so, obviously, the difference, because someone could argue, what, yeah, there is an axiomacity and all those things of these other uh, world systems, but how can you prove Islam? And that's a whole discussion. We say that, you know, the Qur'an is composed of ayat, which literally means an ayah is a sign, is an evidence in and of itself. And it has 6,236 such ayat. So, Allah is telling us in a sense that, look at the Qur'an and you'll find all the evidence you'll need. Once you, understand, once you accept the authority of the primary sources, then the injunctions and prescriptions, which are extensions from that authority, are naturally accepted as well. And once you accept the primacy of the Qur'an and Sunnah, then you reject everything else as a, as a matter of fact because it comes from the all-knowing, al-alim, al-khabir, al-hakim, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the all-knowing, the all-aware, the all-wise. So if we accept that the texts come from such an entity, then it's impossible 
for us to have anything better than it in terms of injunctions, prescriptions or laws. And that will be the model, inshallah. Just, just to add to that. Yeah. When it comes to people who are secularists or atheists or liberalism, etc., one thing you've got to bear in mind, and every time a person who believes in God the base of an atheist, for example, we always bring up the argument of subjective and objectivity. Who can objectively prove what is right or wrong? An atheist can never do that. For example, somebody commits a crime, one person's opinion is he should be executed, the other one knows he should go to jail for five years and serve half the time, etc. These are just personal opinions. Whereas, when you bring God into the picture, you have an objective criteria to mm. say whether something is morally right or wrong. Now, when it comes to religions, then, for example, the Christians will have a certain morality that they get from their scriptures. Hindus will have a certain way of looking at things morally that they get from their scriptures. Then we have to look at which scripture can be authentically and historically traced to a source, etc. And then that's the debate of the Bible, does it go back to the prophets, etc. Does the Quran go back to Prophet Muhammad and in peace? Is the proof of his popular, etc. So then we can objectively see what is morally right or wrong. Um, one question is in regards to you said um, it's the job or the responsibility of the LMA to do the interpretations. I feel like one of the biggest issues in our um, Muslim communities these days is the matter of interpretation because I feel like any 16 year old on Twitter will tell you, oh, this is how I interpretate this. And um, especially with, for example, the issue of Kudar, the dress that I've been in the room, um, nowadays, like, Everybody here knows someone who's taken up every day. And um, when you come to justify it, first of all, we don't justify it. But we just tell you, I'm on a journey, everybody's on a journey. And I feel like it's very hard to even read these things these days. They don't even want to have conversation or they're not even up for any, you know, civilized conversation about things. So I'm the only one who's the only one who's the only one So in my, I think you guys need to comment on this. In regards to interpretations, you said that it's a piece of the Which, who exactly is an element? Because I feel like these days, a girl, a MA at Mosque in an Islamic study will tell you it should be her own interpretation. And who, like, who is that as an island, for example, if that's the easiest to address it? Because it's a Malas island, it's a really dumb thing, and then obviously I'll come, come to get into the other stuff if that's the best way to Thank you. Um, there's a, that's an interesting question and um, the answer to that question is found in a lot of the works of scholars um, that have written about this. For example, Shokani has written something uh, about this and he talks about the prerequisites of our alim. And he mentions like seven or eight different prerequisites. They have to know, you know, they have to have a deep knowledge of the Arabic language. They have to have memorized the ayat of ahkam, at least of the Quran. Some say you have to memorize the Quran. And so on. And this, there is a degree of subjectivity as to what counts as alim. But uh, in, in essence, really, a alim is someone who can do istinbat. And the evidence of that is where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, the alim ahu ladina yastambitona wa minhum. That the people that can do istinbat would have known it from, this is in Surah An Nisa. Allah uraduhu ila rasulu wa ila ulil amri minhum, la alim ahu ladina yastambitona wa minhum. That if you if they brought it back to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the people of istinbat, so the istinbat is the the process of extrapolation. Yes, these are the ulama, the people that can access at least the usul that they can understand how to extrapolate, etc. Now, in terms of what the ummah has accepted, um, obviously you have the four, you have the sahaba, the Alama, any Sahabi is alim, then you have gradation in terms of that. Ibn Hajj al Asqalani uh, mentions who are the specialists in what field. Ibn Mas'ud, for example, is a specialist in the Quran. Ibn Abbas is a specialist in the Quran and has the tazki of the Rasulullah. Um, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَإِنْ آمَنُوا بِمِثْلِ مَا آمَنْتُمْ بِهِ فَقَدْ اِهْتَدَوْا Which is very interesting as well. 
if they believe in what you guys believe in, then they are on the right path. Meaning the Sahaba. He didn't say ma aman tabihi. It's ma aman tum bihi, which is direct, directly um, talking to the primary audience. So there is evidence from the Quran that the first ulama are the Sahaba. After that, those who they have given the permission to, if you like, those who they have uh, have, have given the tazkiyah to, the tabi'in, the atba tabi'in. Obviously, in that you have Abu Hanifa was the first one uh, of the four schools of thought, and people like him in his time, Ibrahim al Nakhai, you know, Al Awza'i, and others, you know. And then afterwards, the four schools of thought and those people who understood their works and their direct disciples of those uh, particular four schools, the scholars. Uh, Al Bukhari. No one's going to mention that Bukhari is not a scholar. You know, it's, it's very difficult to make the case. You know, it gets a bit hazy, like you said, now in the contemporary world, where we identify is this person an alim, if this person is not alim. There are a few things you can look out for. If there are people of high prominence, which are referred to as ulama, that agree that this person is alim, then usually that person is counted as alim. Number two, if that person has made a contribution, a publication. But it's, it's accepted within the field as a legitimate contribution. Its access is um, being responded to, is being referenced. That's another way of finding out if someone is a alim. Um, you don't see the person making rudimentary mistakes or on issues which are ru uh, rudimentary or otherwise. Then and, uh, these things. And obviously, if they have a large following, sometimes that can be, that can be uh, an indication. But it can't, sometimes it can't be. That's, that's a double-edged sword. So uh, that requires, it's not enough to just have someone with a large following. They have to have a large following. Among them are the academics. Among them are those people of knowledge as well. But there is always going to remain a degree of subjectivity to it. Um, we can't solve the problem completely. There's no magic cure here. Uh, in terms of the hijab, sorry, I forgot that part of the question. And this is my way of, I've, yes, it's, it's a very good point, yeah? Um, of the hijab and I think I've got a way of dealing with it now. I've been thinking about it <laughs> I've, been, I've actually been thinking about it quite deeply and there are some people in the Ummah now that they believe this is their perspective Yeah, there are dhanni verses and qata'i verses. There are verses of qata which means that they are explicit and there are dhanni verses and they say look if the verse is dhanni it means that you can have different ijtihadat, you can have different understandings etc. Let us interpret it in whatever ways. There should be a plurality of ideas and if you extend that idea to its logical extreme, yeah, and you say there should be a plurality of ideas, and you have no right to tell me what the predecessors said, you have no right to tell me kafan aqadul ijma, how the ijma was uh, came into being before, and all those things, you have no right to tell me those. Things. I say no problem. If that is your madhab, if that is your belief, I say. So what do you say of the ijtihad of ISIS? They're forced to actually accept that. You know that. They can only say la darar wa la darar. It's hurting the people, and the, but ISIS extremist group that killed the people and they're bad. But according to your hermeneutical understanding of the Quranic discourse, their interpretation of the ayat of qatl and killing and uh, uh, of uh, uh, in hum uh, minhum and killing the children and all of those things, according to their interpretation, according to your methodology, you have to admit. From a hermeneutical perspective, from an exegetical perspective, is absolutely acceptable. There's no way out of this now. If you allow for a plurality of ideas in such a way, you have to allow for the ijtihad. You can't let in card now. You can't say that they're wrong. You can only say they're wrong for moral reasons. But it will be a circular argument because the morals they're saying are from the Quran and Sunnah anyways. So if, if they want to do that, so if you want to uh, expand the parameters so that non-specialists that people of, uh, that we can make new rulings now which were never made before. And this is a key thing, not only in just Islamic law, but in all of legalistic traditions. There's something called precedent. Yeah? A, a, they use case law in many countries. They say, let's see the judgments of those who came before us. They don't make new judgments unless it's a new case. If it's the same case, they, they look at the judgments that came before. But if we're talking about the same rulings that happened for 1,400 years, and now you... X person thinks that you know how to reinterpret the ayat of Surah Al-Nur and the ayat of Surah Al-Ahzab and, and so on, then no problem. You also, if you want to, if you want to expand the parameters to that ex uh, extent, then allow for the interpretation of all of those extremist radicals that blow people up, etc. Because that's also ijtihad. Another thing of to, uh, doing it is an interesting thing. 
There's a verse, I think it's chapter 24, verse 59. Yes? Surah An-Nur. Where it says, Al-Qawa'idu min al-Nisa. The old women of the Nisa, of the old women of the, uh, the old women, yeah? And it says that they can, uh, they, they can take their thiab off. What's thiab? It's, it's a cloth, clothing, yeah? Now, the, the, the first question I ask the person who believes that, because usually the person who believes that the hijab is not, the khimar is not the hijab. That's what their argument, yeah? Their argument that the khimar mentioned in Surah An-Nur and the jilbab, Surah Al-Ahzab, those two, they believe that they are not hijab over the head. They believe it's over the breasts. They believe it's what? Over the breasts. So when it says, uh, So let them throw the uh, khimars over the jub. They say it just means cover your breasts. So I say, okay, no problem. In chapter 24, verse 59, when it talks about those old women, is it saying that they can show their breasts? No, no, no. That, that's what the implication is. If the thiab that they can take off is the khimar, and the khimar or the jilbab is what you, you cover your breasts, then according to you, you can take off, yes, you can show the old woman, older woman now, because she can show her breasts in public. Okay, is, this the, is this your interpretation? They usually run around saying, no, this and that. And Listen, this is the implication of what you're saying. And that's why you have to have a holistic, contextualized understanding of the Quran so now before you make humiliating mistakes. So that's why I'd, I'd probably play it around like that, yeah, inshallah. <laughs>
The Prophet Muhammad said that the men are equal to women. That men are equal to women. Yeah, and this is musawiyat. Some scholars say this means musawiyat. Shakhaiq is musawiyat. However, there are notable exceptions between uh, men and women in certain things, such that men have certain rights and responsibilities that women don't have, and vice versa. Do you know it's interesting we were talking about human rights? Uh, because what the communitarians actually say, going back to this, because it will, it will link in in a second, the communitarians say, we shouldn't be a rights obsessed culture, yeah? And they say that rights and respons responsibilities go hand in hand, basically, yeah? So, you know, we always say, what are the rights of the man? What are the rights of the woman? And so on, yeah? What are the rights of individuals and human beings? What are the rights of nations? What are the rights? And so on. We don't, we have a universal uh, declaration of human rights, but we don't have a universal declaration of human responsibilities, right? And that's what the communitarians would argue, say rights and responsibilities go hand in hand. The witness in Islam, the shahid, is different to a rawi, by the way. A rawi is a narrator. And by, by the way, both of them fulfill the same practical functionality. They do. A rawi of the hadith, they, they, they narrate the hadith. And they're basically narrating it all the way back to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And as we know, the, the greatest ruat of the hadith, some of them are women. And one woman equaled one man in that context, as a narrator of hadith. And that's more important than anything else, because you're transmitting the deen, the religion of Islam. You're telling me what the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said. You're telling, you're, your ruling here, or your narration here, has so much practical implication for more, my life, that not only will I accept it, but future generations, etc. will accept it, and so on. So, as a narrator, there is no su suspect or indifferent treatment or something like that, yeah, between men and women. Really, the truth is, it's as a witness that we have to talk about, yeah, as a witness. Now, why do we always say that why do women have less rights as witnesses? Why don't we say why do women have less responsibilities? And I'll give you an example, right? Punitively and classically, what happens to witnesses if they are seen to speak falsehood? Tell me, someone put their hands up, tell me what happens, yes. They get lashed, lashed, yes. Even in some cases in the Sharia, according to classical theory, or, or classical books, etc. If four people come, one of them is lying, all of them get lashed. Yeah, you know this. Believe me. Believe me, yeah. If this was the case and a woman was being lashed and she didn't do anything wrong, you know what the West would say to you? How can you give this woman lashes and she did nothing wrong? You never think of witness testimony as responsibility. Why do you not think of it as responsibility? You, you, you can get whipped. If you, if, you, if you Even just being part of the process, you get whipped. You see what I'm trying to say? You can flip this whole thing around by saying, if we did have the same responsibilities for men and women in this uh, bab, in this context here, then there would be complaints because you would say, why are women being whipped and punished, etc.? It's not something you want to be. You don't want to be a witness in Islam. Why is it seen as a good... Because it's, we, are in, we are entrenched in this rights culture. Oh, you have a right to two votes, uh, two witness testimony for a man. You have responsibility that's more than a woman now. You can be whipped for doing nothing wrong, in a sense. You have to be put in a position of social responsibility. So Allah has alleviated a woman from that to a great extent. And so has the sunnah. Isn't this exactly what the feminists would have wanted anyways? Think about it. It's, it's giving women preferential treatment. How is this seen as... I mean, I always see this as, as quite ironic. As a, uh, 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 why is it that one man's uh, witness testimony... That's preferential treatment for women, considering the punitive repercussions of a woman, yes, or a man in, in this case, uh, making a false testimony, or someone in his uh, group of testimonies, uh, people that give testimonies, give a false testimony, all of them get whipped. So it's, it's, a, it's a lack of understanding of, of the religion, lack of understanding of rights culture, this whole thing of rights, yes, men have more rights, yeah, sometimes they do, yeah. Sometimes men have more rights than women in Islam, no problem. But they also have more responsibilities. And this is what subhanAllah at Tabari said in his verse when he said, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, rijali alayhinna daraja. He says, This daraja, because Allah says that they are, mithlu alayhinna bil They have the same as what they get, bil ma'roof. 
وللرجال عليهن درجة and that for men is a degree of responsibility among them. At-Tabari says this is mas'uliyya, it's responsibility. So this is, Tabari died 324 AD. He's part of, if you want to call it that, the Salaf. He's an old, the first Mufassir. You know, he's not a liberal apologist. This is his belief. Yeah? So what I'm trying to say is that we shouldn't always look at rights as only rights. They're rights and responsibilities. And when you consider all of those factors, then you realize that it's a mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he doesn't put women in that position. Because if they are put in that position, they are physically weaker than men. And that's almost any feminist would tell you that as a matter of fact. No, don't get angry, sister. Now. <laughs> almost any sister would tell you, uh, any, uh, sorry, feminist would tell you this, yeah? And that's, and that's the reality. So why would they be put in a position where they're susceptible to more physical uh, pain in the context of an Islamic state? Of course, we don't mean this in the context because this stuff doesn't mean much in the context of other than an Islamic state. So considering all those points, I think the inheritance is not true, by the way, to say that men get more than women. What did you say? Yes, it's not true. Look at the verses in Surah Nisa. There are many cases, many, many cases where women get more than men. Yeah? If there were more than two girls, then they get two thirds of what there's been, uh, has been distributed. That is the highest amount of any distribution given to females. So in this case, if there's men and women, yes, but the boys and the, there's only girl, there's only daughters, there's no uh, sons. This, what the right thing to say is the son gets the most. That's completely true. Yeah. If you say the son gets the most, the that the, the son gets the, 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 the amount of two. We're talking about the son versus the daughter in that context. We're not talking about two brothers and sisters. We're not talking about mother and uh, father. Because we know that yeah, they get, if there's a son, they get one, th- uh, one surah. If there's no son, they get one surah, which is if there's a son, they get one sixth. If there's no son, they get one third, and so on. And so the mother and father get the same. And they're man and woman. But why is that not seen as? So it's clear here that there's, a, there's an economic reason, obviously of redistribution. Yeah? The son has more responsibilities in Islam. He has to pay mahar and whatnot. is going gonna, is, is gonna to be, you know, بِمَا أَنفَقُوا مِنْ أَمْوَالِهِمْ الرِّجَالُ قَوْمٌ عَنِ السَّاءِ بِمَا فَضَّ اللَّهُ بَعْضَهُمْ عَلَىٰ وَبِمَا أَنفَقُوا مِنْ أَمْوَالِهِمْ And because they have to give now. So the son has to give more than the daughter and therefore he's given a little bit more of a subsidy, if you like, through the inheritance. It makes perfect sense through this economic redistribution model. So what's the problem? I mean, once again, they, they see things in black and white because they're obsessed with rights culture. They have understanding of equality, which has, be, has to be completely fixed. Although they themselves, they themselves don't have fixed equality. In my, in my country that I live in, my country, you can say, no problem. You know, women get one year maternity leave. If they have a baby, they, they're off work one year, paid. Men get two weeks. It's not equality. You know, what's going on here? Say, well, it's a biological difference to say that. So if you agree that different things should be treated differently because of their difference. Once again, say that one more time for the people. Okay. Different things should be t- treated differently, differently on account of their difference. If, you're, if you agree with that premise, then don't ask questions about why this... I'm not asking you, but for the feminists. Don't ask questions about why is this different to this and why is that different to this, right? So. I think we need to wrap up because it's time. Wrap up, yes. I think we've got the last question. Last, yeah, last question. question. Is there anyone who will ask? Okay, our brother has a question. Yes, yeah, got the mic already. Uh, I will first start uh, to thank Siga Civil Society for holding this event and I will thank you for accepting this invitation. Well, I studied political science here in this university. And, uh, you know, the title is Liberalism, we can change it for democracy, we can change it for secularism. And we, the Muslim, we have this great gift. Like, we can address the problems, like, so easy. And just we will lay down in the uh, coach, we will drink tea and eat karate. Like, we don't, we don't have it. I'm, I'm so sorry. So we address the problems, then we say. As just uh, my sister Khadija addressed the, the problems of who are the scholars and what they can do and how they will do it. My question is actually like I have so many comments in the sense like when the Prophet passed away, so the the for Khulafa Rashidin, different types of political society, political systems, how they, they rule the country, then until Muawiyah came and destroyed everything, not uh, no need to mention that stuff. My question is like, do the Muslim scholars are uh, not able to produce a new political system, a new political ideology that can that can work and function in these days, since we, when we will take liberalism, we have trouble. When we will take 
secular, secularism will have problem. And please, like, I know you will say, like, you have to go to Sharia. Which Sharia? Which, with, uh, which uh, interpretation? You know, like, uh, I don't know, Maliki will interpret it different regarding to the political system that we use. Muslims in day-to-day -day life, they are amazing. When it came to political system and how they will rule the country, I don't know, some will say like, you have to follow the, the, the head of the state, even he will like, Yajul even he will slap your back, you know, you know what I mean? So my, my, my question is, do the Muslim, uh, are not, the scholar are not able to produce a new political system? Are they or are they are not? If yes, how it will be, or if not, why they are not? And, and thanks. I have got a comment, if I may allow to say. You can interpret it in the way that Prophet Sallallahu interpreted it. Like, how Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did, you can do the same, why are we following the others, right? Time is finished. Like, this is the way, which is the most sacred to answer. Ah, uh, right. Yeah. But I have thought, Muslim, if we're allowed to ask. Let, let, let him ask. We're here in Turkey. Oh, right. right. yes. Actually, my question is, uh, first of all, I want to thank you for coming here and giving this important lecture. Um, uh, my question is, it's not just a question. Uh, I just want to ask about our duties uh, as a young listeners here to stop, I mean, the people who are trying to um, um, brainwash the Muslims' youth. youth sorry. So what, what's your comments, guys? Uh, what would you advise? Yeah. You mean how to stop them, or why should you no, stop them? Well, I can speak from personal experience. Growing up in the UK, I didn't have much pride in the Dean. I fell very far from the Dean for a good 10 years, and I took pride in other things like music stars and movie stars, etc. And that made me live a very secular lifestyle. The biggest advice I can give to Muslims to curb this is we need to reignite our pride in our deen and our religion and we have to do that by reading our sources especially the life of the Prophet Muhammad peace, and the Sahaba etc and when you read their life as I personally did you will gain a new a newfound respect for your deen and you'll understand um, the power of Islam and the real reason why Islam spread like it did, it didn't spread by the sword. That's propaganda against us. Read your sources, get to know Prophet Muhammad and the peace, and the people who don't know him, give them a, a copy of a biography of the Prophet peace be upon him. When we get to know our sources properly, we will have our own pride in our deen and we will not be influenced by outside forces. That's my personal opinion. And I advise every person here to read our sources especially the biography of the Prophet Muhammad on whom we please. Do you have another question? Yeah. The, the other brother first. <laughs> yes, uh, in regards to what political system, I mean, we have to think about two things. One, the course of history hasn't shown us that Muslims have not been able to manage countries. That's, that's an orientalist understanding of, um, of our history. Obviously, there were times in our history, not just the Khulafat Rashid and Mahdiwan, but others, that came after that where we were the leading empire you know and obviously the infrastructure in place was put in place the Ottomans had a very very uh, sophisticated bureaucracy a very and they didn't require any uh, you know white English uh, colonists to come and tell them how to manage the, the, the situation so I'm telling you that I think there is this um, orientalist understanding of our history which needs to be revisited and reassessed uh, the comment on Muawiyah, I don't agree with it because obviously at the time of Muawiyah there was relative peace uh, when he was actually in charge. People don't realize that. When he was in charge there was relative peace. Obviously there was wars, yes, and we don't deny those wars ever happened, but there was long periods of peace in his uh, premiership, which needs to also be accounted for. Um, the idea of this movement from uh, from Khulafat uh, Rashidun Mahdiwun ila and to, to this idea of monarch, monarchism or like the idea of a monarchy to Mulk Na'ab which is what the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam predicted he said this is what's going to happen this is actually a prediction from Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he said that this was going to happen you're going to start off with 40 years uh, sorry 30 years of uh, Khilafah uh, and this is going to be the Khilafah and this hadith is in Muslim Ahmad and actually if you add up all the four, four Khilafah it's exactly 30 years by the way um, and then, then this was so. All of these things are predicted. Th there are areas in the Sharia where you can do your own Shihad and areas of the Sharia where you can't. 
So an effective political system is where you put everything into the situation. You have someone who knows. You need people to know the waqa of the situation in that particular country, the, the real situation there. They need to collaborate very well with the scholars of Islam and there needs to be a good liaison between those two parties. And then we, we do like any other uh, nation would do. We come to conclusions as to how we should move forward. And I don't think Turkey is doing that badly, actually, come to think about it, in terms of political and economic systems. I don't think many, even now, I mean, uh, they're not doing that badly. Uh, and I think that is going on to some extent, even though it's not as it used to be historically for political reasons. But um, having said all of that, um, I think generally speaking, the, ishtihad, the door of Ishtihad is not closed. So there is the matter of, like I said, the balance between Ishtihad and you do your own kind of rationalizing of, of the situation and connecting that directly and inextricably with the Nusus uh, al the Kitab al Sunnah. And that's how we're going to come. Inshallah, success in this world and the hereafter, because it's not just all about this world. We're not economic, we're not um, economic materialists. That's not what we're uh, striving for. We also have ukhrawi, We have like um, hereafter uh, ambitions as well. Inshallah. Yes. Uh, I think with that we should wrap up here, sir, because it's gone beyond the time now. Unless the organisers are okay with that. Yeah, Linda. <laughs> Um, Assalamu alaikum, my name is Linda and um, I'm a senior research associate at the uh, Center for Islam and Global Affairs and at the same time I'm also an advisor for the uh, Student Society. First of all, I would like to very much thank our speaker Mohammed Hijab for coming here. Um, it has certainly been a pleasure to us to listen to you and also other brothers for uh, joining the Q&A. It has been really fruitful and I have I have enjoyed this session and I'm sure that the others have also done so. Um, I mean, we can see this from the amount of questions, obviously. I would just like to um, have one last question um, here. I think um, we didn't much talk about the uh, um, societal level of liberalism and its effect on the Muslim communities, especially in the Western context. We have been talking quite a lot about the uh, you know, the daily practices and uh, about our Iman and Akida and these issues. But how I see it from the um, perspective where I come from, I'm studying Islamophobia and um, I'm also looking at these initiatives, uh, so-called um, liberal Muslim initiatives or liberal Muslim mosques that we do have, for example, mm -hmm. in Germany. Um, I'm not so sure how many you might have in the UK. Um, for certain there are some. Um, in any case, I would like to know what would your advice be for those um, Muslim youth in the Western context who are struggling with this um, dichotomy of, on the other hand, yes, we do have the extremist, group, extremist groups and um, we are constantly under the pressure of distancing ourselves from them, right? But then on the other hand, we are now uh, experiencing this, um, you know, growing trend of liberal Muslim you know, movements and these mosques, and especially I see it very detrimental to the uh, wider Muslim community because that is the kind of voice that gets heard in the society because they are certainly supported by the states. And this all has to do also with the CVE, you know, these, these kind of um, prevent programs. So what would you, your advice be for those Muslim youth in, in the Western context? How can we basically um, you know, find a way um, to, you know, like handle the situation in, in, in such a manner that we don't get demonized if we do not agree to these liberal views, right? And at the same time, we won't be seen as, you know, radicals. And um, with this question, I would like to um, end, end this <laughs> wonderful event. And then also, by the way, we do have a at outside, so there is uh, chai and some cookies for those who want to um, stay for, for further discussions. Thank you. How, um, you know, we agree on this, right? Like the interpretation, interpretation and everything, okay. But what I'm targeting here is that when we in the West where I also come from, or in Europe, let's let's forget the word West anyway. So okay. yeah, so in Europe, for example, so where when we there as as um, you know our Muslim communities are they are diverse, all right, but when there are these certain groups that do get the voice, you know, they get the voice in the media, they get the voice on the policy level, 
you know, they get the support of the state. They are also at the same time involved in CVE um, activities. They are engaging in all of these things that further, you know, um, harm other Muslims. They basically they are demonizing everybody else, right? This is becoming the the dominating narrative. This is becoming the Islam that we are supposed to live in our countries. Now, what I'm, um, you know, wondering is that how those Muslims who still want to get a voice you know, want to have representation in the society, want to be active citizens, contribute to the uh, well-being of the society and the Ummah in, in, in our countries. How do we, um, in the most strategic way, um, you know, uh, tackle this issue of being marginalized at this point? You know, we're being marginalized from there, from the side of the liberals, mm -hmm. but we're also being marginalized on, you know, on that level where you know, only because you're Muslim, you're already, you know, the, the other, all right? So how do we fight these, you know, narratives that are becoming, you know, dominating and we don't necessarily want to um, sign to them? Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it, it's a good question. I, I, I do understand it more clearly now. So I think one, uh, one word answer with this, in, in this case, would be Dawa. Because what we have left today majority of the people that uh, I see in the society, especially in Europe and maybe in the in the West in particular, is many of the people have now become sort of me and my family and everybody else doesn't matter. No, that's not how it is. As Muslims, um, as uh, our basically how the people in the past, um, the ulamas, the, and we have to now take the responsibility because the prophethood has stopped so who's going to now bring or call the people towards the good and stop and forbid them from the evil? The Amr bil Ma'roof wa Nahyan al Munkar is something which is now upon us as the Ummah. If we have stopped giving da'wah and if we have stopped teaching our, our kids the Islam that, is, that they are supposed to learn uh, from us as, as our responsibility, then why would we now look at the other people and blame them that now they are getting the voice, they are getting the airtime, they are getting all this uh, basically, uh, uh, all the newspapers want to now be interested in them is because we ourselves have let our own children down, our own society down, and our own Muslim brothers and sisters down. Because the thing is, Islam is not something people learn from the day they are born. It is something that has to be taught, just like any other field, whether it's engineering, doctors, uh, medicine, I don't know, I mean, whatever it is, it's, it's something that you have to learn. And the same thing with... Uh, Islam that you have to teach your children and you have to teach uh, your your brothers and sisters around the world what what is the right what is what uh, what, what is that they're supposed to do which is legal and which is illegal what is halal and what is haram so these are the basic things that we should learn but many times we don't learn and there are students who go to universities who pick up all these wrong ideas from uh, the uh, the neoconservatives and also from the liberals and the seculars and they come home and they ask the parents, what should we now do with regards to this situation? Obviously the parents might not do, know what to do. So instead of them mm -hmm. consulting the people of knowledge, the ulemas or whoever is responsible in the society who has got the knowledge to uh, address that particular problem, they just say, be a good Muslim, pray five times or read the Quran and that's it. But without them actually taking the initiative that if they don't know the, the answer to the question, take that child to someone who can actually answer, whether it's an imam of the masjid or whether it's some learned scholar in your community. And there's always someone out there who would be able to implement, or, or sorry, who would be able to answer or address that particular point. But if you just leave it, then that address, uh, that uh, sorry, there's no, uh, that problem doesn't solve itself. It has to be solved from the right, uh, from the proper channels, and those channels are still available out there. So, of course, the media today in the West, in particular, they will give more airtime to such people who are the fringe and also the extremists who are also the fringe. They will not give people who are following the true Sunnah and the true, uh, the, the true Quran and the Sunnah, the, they will not give them because it's not something that is in their interest. And that is one of the reasons you'll see Islamophobia as well, because these people are now are given more airtime, so they think that is Islam, but it's not. And as, as, as you know that most of us here actually go to Speaker's Corner 
basically to remedy this, pro remedy this problem. Because that's one place which not only, and, and I would say, thanks to the West as well for giving us this freedom to go there and to speak. So this freedom is something that's available in the West. It's not like you're being hindered for that. But it's just that you're not taking that opportunity to make use of it. Now, nobody's going to stop you anywhere to, to teach them the Quran and the Sunnah. I mean, obviously, there might be exceptions, but I'm not talking about exceptions. Most of Europe, you're still allowed to go and teach them this, uh, the Quran and the Sunnah. Nobody's going to stop you. So in Speaker's Corner, what we do is that there are a lot of people who have these misconceptions and the wrong ideas about what Islam truly is. And <laughs> so I don't think either ISIS or anybody else is going to stop you there from telling you the haq. And alhamdulillah, uh, with, uh, uh, with channels like SC Dawa and other channels like Iyad Dawa, and we have spread this message across the globe. So many of the misconceptions are now addressed in that little place called Speaker's Corner in Hyde Park in London. So yes, there are, there's always a way. Like they say, where there's a will, there's a way. And inshallah, if we, if we go through the right channels, we, we should be able to defeat not only Islamophobia, but also the misconceptions about Islam. And especially with social media today, you youngsters, myself, I mean, I'm still young, <laughs> alhamdulillah. So we can, we can solve this. I mean, they, there are ways which we didn't have before. For example, if I wanted to get my message across today, I can actually go and tweet or I can put it on Facebook or I can shout it out from Speaker's Corner on, and it'll be on YouTube and it'll be available, accessible globally. You know, this is something our, our forefathers did not have as a tool. This is a powerful medium which we all should use and specifically for Dawah, inshallah. Do you want to add something on the Yavan decision? Um, if I understand the question correctly, you're saying that you've got all of these kind of uh, liberalizing policies from uh, from top down and that obviously in terms of who the Western elites want to kind of promote the message of the Muslim with a liberal message. Uh, and I agree with that, but that's why it's important to have a, a degree of self-sufficiency and self-dependence in this regard. So there's two or three things I'll add to this conversation. One of them is that I've been thinking about the differences between the United States of America and the United Kingdom, uh, because I've been doing some travels uh, to the United States, looking at the data there. And what I found is that, I don't want to generalize it, it's, there are many differences in terms of country, etc. It's much bigger country. The USA is like the size, the size of Europe, and the United Kingdom's got about 66 million population. But in terms of apostasy, and this was one thing I focused on, because it, it reveals a lot. In terms of apostasy, according to Pew Research, 23% of Muslims apostate in the United States. Yeah, that's a quarter of Muslims apostate um, all the way. The census data in the United Kingdom shows a much lower le number, maybe maybe less than one percent. Um, demographics show demographic data shows it's once again much lower in, in in Europe generally, but in the United Kingdom, I was looking at in particular. And so the academic exercise that it was not something I formally did, but in my mind I was thinking, what are the differences between the United Kingdom and the United States? And there are two or three things I kind of picked up on. One of them was community. And that's one big theme. They say it takes a, a, a village to raise a child. You know, and it takes a community to keep Muslims steadfast. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, wa tawasa with haqi, wa tawasa with sab. But it's all in the jama'ah. You know, meaning it's, it's in a plural form. Meaning that if we want preservation of religion to be a maqsar al muqasr sharia, objective objective sharia, to be fulfilled, then it has to be a communal effort. Um, and even in countries like, frankly, like uh, our countries in the East, Turkey, Egypt, Tunisia, North Africa, Pakistan, and those countries, you'll find that there are communities which are much more, quote unquote, secular, liberal, and by extension, usually further away from the religion, and other communities which are not like that. And I think there should be a different strategy for each of those different situations. And here's my recommendation. Yeah. Generally speaking, it depends. People of that nation have to come together and kind of look at the data themselves and, the, and have a strategy. But in terms of the West, I believe even though it doesn't fit the Western agenda to kind of be grouped in one location, one geographic location, it helps us economically, it helps us uh, uh, politically and socially, 
with preservation of religion and uh, of the Muslim identity. So in other words, Muslims in Germany, in France, in London, uh, in Birmingham, the reason, uh, one thing they should do is come together. So in other words, literally live next to each other. You should make it, when you're looking to buy a flat or a property, you should look for Muslim areas. <coughs> that's what you should do. Now that's not what they want you to do, because they want you to kind of be dispersed so that they can throw in their kind of, uh, it's easier to take down one person than it is to take down a hundred, yeah? And it's easier to take down, if one person's by themselves, it's easier. But when you have a whole community behind you, you have that confidence. Person's going to the masjid, person, that is a big thing. It keeps the person uh, preserved in terms of religion. So, one recommendation, if you're living in Europe, general rule, look for Muslim areas and live there. Don't live in non-Muslim areas. I know it sounds a bit, you can, with your family, you can do it. If you have very you know, strong uh, will and determination, etc. If you have a choice, live in the Muslim areas. Because economically, at least, you can, you can uh, start your own um, kind of economies in that area. You can, and so on. In non-Muslim countries, uh, sorry, in Muslim countries, it might be the opposite strategy. It might be that the religious need to actually go into the secular areas and start, you know, doing dawah and whatnot. But it's too dangerous to do that in the Muslim, uh, in the non-Muslim world, in the non-Muslim world, because the data has shown us that we can't be stunned by the same uh, insect twice. Obviously, it could lead to a lack of preservation of religion. So, whereas in the West. It makes more sense to come together. In the East, it might not make more sense. But that depends upon the independent ishtihad of the people of that particular country. They have to look at things and data and actually sociologically assess things. Second thing is social media. And he's already kind of uh, mentioned that. Now, we have to exploit the fact that globalization is a worldwide phenomenon now, technology and, and so on. And the only way to compete with media now is social media. You can't compete with media easily. It's, it's very, very expensive to start your own channel. We've looked at the numbers and figures. We know channels, I know how much they spend on, on their licenses and whatnot. It's an expensive thing and it's unnecessarily expensive because social media can, can reach more numbers with social media. So you, you have to have a social media influence. I think we should have now um, kind of a wave in that. In Turkish language, in Arabic language, in all these things. We have to popularize our narrative through social media. That's a very important point that Hashim mentioned, which I, which I totally agree with. That's another part of our strategy which we should totally um, put, in, put into play. Uh, finally, I would say that in terms of economics, I'll tell you one thing. You know the Ahmadi community? I was, I was one guy, is Ahmadi, which is a group of people that believe that it was a prophet after Prophet Muhammad. Anyways, they have a very tightly knit community and he was showing me you know, how they organize themselves. And they organize themselves very in a very disciplined way in, uh, in terms of economics. So, I'm not saying that we should have preferential, because we have laws in place in, in, the, in the West, we can't just have like, you know, religion discrimination, etc. But there's nothing saying that, for example, you can't form networks, economic networks, helping people of the same religion, for example, find jobs, education, and so on. The Jews do it, the Ahmadis do it, and they're very successful in doing so, and they help their people by doing that. So we need to, these are defense mechanisms that have been attempted by people of the past and have been successful. We don't need to reinvent the, reinvent the wheel. Uh, Jewish communities that do, do that and are successful in doing that, we should follow that. Why do we always try and follow them in, in other things? <laughs> like, like theological uh, misapplications of monotheism. Rather we should follow them in these uh, things which have worked for them. So three things. Number one, community. Social community is very important. It takes a, ch uh, a village to raise a child, but it takes a community to, uh, to, to preserve people's religion and identity. Number two, uh, social media, because it's important. And connected to that is also education, by the way. Education, if you can make your own schools and stuff like that, do it with an Islamic ethos. And number three, what did we say was number three? Who was listening? Huh? Yeah, the economy. So try and develop some kind of networks. You know, um, to help Muslim brothers and sisters, and that will help the sense of com uh, camaraderie and fraternity between Muslim brothers and sisters, and also help them develop in uh, society, etc. Uh, and that's, these are my recommendations. Yeah. Just, to, just to add on that point, the reason why we have this power imbalance is because we're weak. So there has to be some strong lobbying which is absent from the Muslim communities. Just like in other communities, just you mentioned, they're very, very powerful lobbying. 
and because of this they get their voices heard and they get their wants already implemented so we need in on, on, on top of all these recommendations a very strong lobby yeah. worldwide globally mm -hmm. because if you cannot maintain this power imbalance then you will constantly have this problem so Muslims have to bring back the balance bring back the power, bring back the authority, bring back the izza of the Muslims. And how we can do that is the question that we have to ask another time. Thank you. I think it's also important that uh, we actually thank those people who made this, um, this particular lecture and this uh, meeting possible. And of course, uh, Sister Linda, who made it uh, possible to have this uh, event, um, and also all the and all the brothers, including uh, our um, media channel here, Essigawa, Alhamdulillah, made it uh, possible for us to uh, not only have this event be um, appreciated by the audience here, but inshallah will be appreciated by all those who will watch it online once it's on YouTube. Inshallah, Jazakallah khairan for your patience and. Uh, apologies for going uh, over the time which was uh, fixed earlier, but Jazakallah uh, khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We as student society, we thank our distinctive speakers. Uh, it was really a fruitful speech and Q&A session. And I also thank you all of you for coming here, sparing your time on such a weekend uh, for such important topic, of course. And uh, it's already Monday time, and you can have your cookies and tea up there. And uh, hope, hope to see you in our upcoming events, inshallah. Thank you very much.